Hello everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I am delighted to introduce you to the superb violinist and violist, Rupert Marshall Luck, who, with pianist Duncan Honeybourn, recorded the stunning CD, The God Marduk, Works for Violin, Viola and Piano by Andrew Downs, released by EM Records in 2019. Hailed by BBC Music magazine for his handsome tone and laser-like tuning, and acclaimed by audiences and critics alike for the verve, commitment and intelligence of his performances, Rupert Marshall Luck appears as soloist and recitalist at major festivals and venues throughout the UK, as well as in France, Germany, the Netherlands, the Republic of Ireland, South Africa, Sweden, Switzerland and the USA. His extensive discography includes many world premiere recordings, as well as conspectuses of the complete music for violin and piano of Herbert Howells and Hubert Parry. And his solo performances have been frequently broadcast on BBC Radio 3, ABC Classic FM Australia, RTE Island, SABC South Africa, Radio Suisse Romande Switzerland, and in Canada, France, New Zealand, and the USA. His recordings have attracted glowing critical acclaim from the international musical press, including BBC Music Magazine, Gramophone, International Record Review, Music Web International, and The Strad. A recent five-star review of Joseph Holbrook's F Major Sonata in the French music publication Classica stated, the perilous double-stopping passages are overcome by Rupert Marshall Luck with an athletic ease, while his warm tone is marvellous in the elegiac lyricism of the slow movement. A disc of John Pickard's chamber music for Toccata Classics was also praised by Fanfare in the USA, being highlighted as a compact disc not to be missed. Engagements in the 2018-19 season have so far included a concert tour of South Africa, including recitals in Johannesburg and Pretoria, a recording of works for solo violin by contemporary Faroese composers, and the world premiere performance of a new work for violin and piano by David Matthews. Among forthcoming projects are performances and a recording of works by the French-Israeli-British composer Nimrod Borenstein, a return visit to South Africa in 2020 and performances in Germany next season of Coleridge Taylor's Violin Concerto using a new scholarly critical edition. As well as his busy schedule as a soloist and chamber musician, Rupert is active as a writer and speaker on the performing aspects of music and he has presented lecture recitals, seminars and masterclasses at the universities of Bristol, Cambridge and Oxford at Birmingham Conservatoire, the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and the Royal Academy of Music, and at University College London. His radio broadcasts include several appearances on BBC Radio 3's In Tune and a programme for Radio 4's series Tales from the Stave. And his article, Volksmusik, Landschaften und Turbulenzen, Die Lieder und die Kammermusik von Vaughan Williams, that is, Folk Tunes, Landscape and Turbulence, The Songs and Chamber Music of Vaughan Williams, was published in Edition Text and Critique in December 2018. His scholarly critical edition of Elgar's Sonata for Violin and Piano, Opus 82, was published earlier this year by G. Henler Verlag of Munich. This forms part of a series of editions for the publisher, which together will comprise the complete violin music of Elgar. Without further ado... We will now hear Poem, The God Marduk, Opus 72, by Andrew Downs, for violin and piano, performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the violin and Duncan Honeybourne on the piano. The God Marduk was an ancient Babylonian god. The music sums up the awe-inspiring aspect of an ancient mythical god and also the playful nature he was said to have.
How utterly beautiful. You can purchase this CD, The God Marduk, Works for Violin, Viola and Piano by Andrew Downs at andrewdowns.com where the WAVs and MP3s are also available to download. You can read about the premieres of Andrew Downs' works for violin and piano on the blog of his wife and publisher Cynthia Downs, also available at andrewdowns.com. And now to our guest, violinist and violist, Rupert Marshall Luck. Hi Rupert. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Pleasure. Could you tell us about your background and how you came to be a violinist? I grew up listening to various violin recordings, notably Itzhak Perlman, the Amadeus Quartet. In fact, my first ever musical memory is of hearing the Amadeus Quartet playing the Schubert String Quintet with William Pleath on a record that my parents had. This was particularly significant because it was the first time I'd ever cut my finger. I was just over a year old. Oh and uh, yes, and I wasn't happy apparently until I chewed the elastoplast off my finger. <laughs> And for many, many years afterwards, the sound of the opening of the Schubert String Quintet was indelibly associated with the taste of elastoplast, so that's how powerful <laughs> it was. But when I got a bit older, I realised that there was something about the violin that very much attracted me, the sound, the, the lyricism of the instrument, and of course, mm. listening to such artists heightened that characteristic in a very real way for me. And so when I had the opportunity to take up an instrument, I chose the violin, and that was in school, mm. the days when schools still offered music lessons to their mm. pupils. Yeah. And very quickly, I progressed to the point where my parents were advised to find a better teacher, mm. a more specialist teacher. And so I started studying with James Coles, who I believe is well known to your family mm -hmm. because he's played a number of your father's works. Yeah. And I studied with Jim until I went to university at the age of 18. So it was a very long period I had with him and he did oh, a huge gosh. amount for me in terms of technical grounding. He made me play all the Kreutzer etudes, the road etudes, scale systems and so on, as well as the, the standard repertoire that was suitable for my development at the time. So it was a very thorough grounding I had with him, which was fantastic. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Sounds like you worked very hard. <laughs> it was worked very hard, but it paid dividends later because having taught myself later on, students coming through who hadn't had the privilege of that, that grounding, realised, mm. you know, what a tremendous privilege it was to have that. And although I might have resented slightly at the time the need to practice Kreutzer number two again, <laughs> it was nevertheless very valuable in the longer term. No doubt about that at all. Absolutely. And now could you tell us about EM Records? Yes, well, this, this came about fairly casually, I'm, I must admit. When I met Em, my wife, who runs the English Music Festival, we were discussing other ways in which this music could be brought to a wider public. Because, of course, it's, it's great having a festival in Oxfordshire and having the opportunity to play little known works by British composers. But of course, it, it only impacts, if you like, on the people who attend the concerts. So we were thinking about ways in which we could bring this music to wider audiences. And I, I think it was I who suggested, and claims it was I who suggested anyway, a record label, mm -hmm. because at that time, there are more record labels doing it now. But at that time, there were very few record labels really concentrating on works by British composers, particularly lesser known ones, lesser known works, lesser known composers. So mm. that was really how the record label started. And our first disc was um, Bliss York Bowen and Walford Davis. And mm. we progressed from there. So we have many genre now. I think the only thing we haven't done so far is an opera. Oh, right. So we have orchestral works, we have solo piano music, we have string quartets, string quintets, a wealth of repertoire. So it's been a great compliment to the festival to have that. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Can you tell us how we find all of your recordings? You can visit my website because I have recorded for other labels as well. I have recorded a disc for Toccata Classics, which is John Picard, another mm -hmm. very fine contemporary composer. And I've actually got a disc which is coming out this autumn, a rather unusual disc. It's works by contemporary Faroese composers. Oh, wow. 
Sounds amazing. Well, you wouldn't have thought that there would be that many Faroese composers, <laughs> but in fact there are. There's a huge consortium, if you like, of composers who belong to a, it's almost like a guild. This has been going for, I think, about 25, 30 years, something like that. They have an associated record label, Tutel Records, which has its own shop in Turshan, mm-hmm. the Faroese capital. But they have a huge variety of genre, not just classical folk and jazz and so on as well. But this is a disc of solo violin works by Faroese composers, which has been fascinating. So all that's on my Mm. website. EM Records, of course, has its own website, em-records.com, where all those other discs, all the British music discs we've recorded are available. And you can listen to excerpts and purchase online from there as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And now moving on to the God Marduk CD that you've recently released. Indeed, yes. Can you tell us how this particular recording came about? I think the way it worked was that I heard about the sacred mass for solo violin before I actually became involved with the English Music Festival OEM Records, which must have been back in 2008, 2009, around that sort of time. Mm. And I got in touch with Andrew, who very kindly sent me a copy of the score. But it proved quite difficult to find a suitable opportunity to perform it. It's such a distinctive work, um, Mm. such an individual work, that it really needs a proper context in order to present it properly. But when I became involved with the English Music Festival and EM Records, subsequently, of course, I met Duncan Honeybourne, who I know you've known for many years and has performed Mm. a lot of your father's music. He made me more aware of Andrew's compositions. I then did a little bit more research and found these other works for violin and piano and of course the viola sonata as well and we thought well this would make a marvelous recording because of course Mm -hmm. placing the sacred mass in the context of other works by Andrew makes it absolutely ideal and of course Mm -hmm. it's a single composer disc which also has huge advantages from the publicity point of view and many of them were recorded for the first time which was an added bonus so it was a fantastic privilege to be able to undertake such a project and of course to have the responsibility of committing many of these works to disc for the first time which was great well it's an absolutely stunning cd thank you very much indeed thank you we're utterly delighted with it so thank you we are now going to hear rupert marshall luck playing gloria in excelsis deo from andrew down's sacred mass for solo violin the sacred mass was commissioned by james coles rupert's teacher in 2000 for his solo recitals in churches and cathedrals in Normandy and the south of France. James Coles recorded this work on his CD entitled Echo Dete, available from andrewdowns.com. Thank you. 
Some amazing pizzicato there from Rupert Marshall Luck. That was his recording of Andrew Down's Gloria in Excelsis Deo from Sacred Mass for solo violin. The whole mass can be heard on the CD The God Marduk, released by EM Records in 2019. This CD, as well as the MP3s and WAV files, can be purchased at andrewdowns.com. The sheet music for all of these works is also available at andrewdowns.com to purchase as hard copies or as digital downloads. How do you find playing the unaccompanied mass as opposed to Downs works with piano? I think it's in some ways a very different approach one has to take when playing work for solo violin because obviously when you have two instruments you have two instruments that are responsible for color texture and so on when it's solo violin you have just the one instrument obviously and so very often you will find that composers and this work is no exception will write a greater range of color a greater range of possibilities will be exploited in any given work so as we've just heard in the gloria we have the extensive use of pizzicato which Mm. is a very particular sonority on the violin and that's not used as much in the violin and piano works and you also have different registrations being used a lot more in much closer juxtaposition which brings technical challenges Mm. but nevertheless also as a performer gives you a greater possibility for finding those different colors and for bringing those colors out to a much greater extent than you might do when you're playing with piano because as I say then you have the collaboration the shared responsibility for that Mm. I I think the other thing that struck me very much when I played the sacred mass for the first time was the great sense of stillness that Andrew achieves in his writing in some of the movements most notably in the Kyrie the first movement and Mm. the last movement the Agnus Dei there's a great sense of Tranquility is the wrong word. That sounds almost too passive. It's almost an expectation. I'm not quite sure how he does it, but it's absolutely (laughs) fantastic that he generates that atmosphere. I think that's something that's really only realistic to expect when you're writing for a solo instrument. Because, of course, when you have a duo, at least one or other instrument will be present in the texture, as it were, at all times. Whereas when you have a a single instrument, there's that possibility for, with a violin, um gradually tapering a note off towards a conclusion and having to do it in such a way that the listener is never quite sure whether the note's finished or not and they're (laughs) on the edge of their seat listening for the the end of the note and that generates a, a real frisson i think in performance which is something very very special that's really fascinating thank you for all of that i'm now going to play sonata for violin and piano by andrew downs performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the violin and Duncan Honeybourne on the piano.
You can hear more of that beautiful work and performance on the CD The God Marduk Works for Violin, Viola and Piano by Andrew Downs, performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the Violin and Viola and Duncan Honeybourne on the Piano. You can hear me interviewing Duncan Honeybourne on episode 5 of this podcast series. And now back to Rupert Marshall Luck. When and why did you start playing the viola? Well, this was something that was first mooted by Jim Coles. He used to run chamber music sessions on Saturdays at his home. So I would have my violin lesson in the morning, nine o'clock till 11.30, whenever it was. And then mm. back home... That's from, long. It, well, it was, yes. <laughs> As I said, he was very <laughs> intense, so it was uh, <laughs> that length of time was necessary. Wow. So back home for a quick lunch, and then in the afternoon, um, I think it was three or four hours of chamber music workshops with him and, oh, and, wow. and associated professional colleagues. And, Sounds amazing. Uh, yeah, it was. I don't think my parents were quite as pleased to be doing all the driving. I think my father was quite <laughs> pleased when I reached the age of 17 and I could take myself to these things. But anyway, yeah, they, they, were, they were tremendous about it. But, mm-hmm. So he suggested one day that I might like to try my hand at the viola in some of the chamber groups I was involved with. I must have been 13, 14, something like that, I suppose. And the first piece I played on the viola was a movement from Les Vendredis, which is not often played now, actually. It's a collection of works by Russian composers, which was stimulated by the informal concerts, try-throughs and discussions that happened in the higher echelons of Russian society. It was founded, I think, by Rimsky-Korsakov. And musicians used to meet together and discuss ideas and try their works to each other and comment on their work. So it was very much a sort of a workshop type environment. Anyway, that was the first piece I played on the viola. And then I was really thrown in at the deep end with the second movement of the Brahms Sextet number one in B flat, Mm -hmm. which of course has a very prominent viola part. Gosh. And I thought I was going to be playing second viola because I really hadn't played the viola that much. (laughs) But no, 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 thank you very much. We'd like you to play first viola. Wow. That was a real that was a real <laughs> test because obviously playing the viola is quite a different thing from the violin in many ways. It's not just about a different clef and most of the time and playing on you know a lower pitched instrument, a larger instrument. There are all sorts mm. of other technical considerations you have to bring to bear on the instrument when you switch from one to the other. Mm. So that was my start on the viola. And wow. it hasn't ever taken the place of the violin. I'm still very much first and foremost a violinist, but it's wonderful to play the viola when I get the opportunity to do so. And to be in the middle voice, because there are various, you know, as a violinist, whether it's in a string quartet or with violin and piano, or even in orchestral playing, of course, the violin often has the top or near to the top line in the texture and being in the middle of the texture can give you a different perspective on music generally and obviously the work Mm. you're playing on at the time particularly. You said you're definitely more of a violinist you sound absolutely beautiful on the viola as well. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) I think it might be my favourite work on the CD the Downs Viola Sonata. Mm. I just love that recording. Can you tell me what the challenges of that piece are? Well just from the mechanical point of view when you play the viola you are obviously dealing with strings that are much thicker than those of the violin and Mm. the result of that is they don't speak as immediately I'm not a brass or a wind player so I might be getting this completely wrong but my understanding is that you've got a very similar characteristic or can have a very similar characteristic on the horn and that it can be quite difficult to get the column of air moving so to speak to vibrate And that's part of the skill of being a horn player. So from that point of view, it's an extremely appropriate choice for the version um, to be Mm. made from the horn to the viola. Just to explain to our listeners, this work, Sonata for Viola and Piano by Andrew Downs, is actually a transcription by Cynthia Downs of Andrew Downs' Sonata for Horn and Piano. As it is a version, I say I prefer not to think of it too much as originally a horn piece. Of course, Mm. one is always aware of that. But it's a little bit like the Prokofiev D major violin sonata. You're aware that it was originally composed for flute, but then Prokofiev made the version for David Oistrakh, and it's a violin work as well. And I think it's a little bit the same with this, in that the possibilities are very well suited to the viola so it becomes possible to view it 
as a viola work in a self-contained way, if that makes sense. Yeah, having, okay. having, having said that again, um, there are certain colours that are very characteristic of the hall. I'm thinking of the opening of the second movement, for example, that quiet but very prominent um, fanfare-like figure. Mm. And the fact that that comes out of silence, um, the viola on its own, um, the piano joins later on. So you have that picture in your mind if you like of a horn fanfare perhaps the player standing on a hill in the distance and the sound <laughs> coming across the countryside um, a summoning mm. if you like from afar which is something you try and achieve on the viola as a horn player would try and achieve in a performance of that work right so you've got to find a similar quality of projection i suppose that's really interesting here is the second movement allegro moderato from andrew down's sonata for viola and piano performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the viola and Duncan Honeybourne on the piano.
I just love that piece and the rich viola tone of Rupert Marshall Luck. You can hear more from Duncan Honeybourne on his CD entitled Daybreak in the Fields, All the Piano Works by Andrew Downs, released by EM Records in 2018. This is also available at andrewdowns.com. You can hear the horn version of that viola sonata performed by James Lowe on the horn and Anne Madison on the piano on the CD entitled Schloss Concert, which can be purchased at andrewdowns.com. Two questions we always ask our guests because they are important to the Downs family. Why is music education important? I think there are many aspects to this and I think this is a discussion that could go on for a long time but (laughs) I think what I feel myself is that firstly music education teaches an appreciation of music from the inside so to speak. I think one has a much more vivid understanding of music with such a grounding. It doesn't necessarily have to be instrumental tuition. I think the opportunity to listen to music in schools, to be instructed or to be encouraged as what to listen to, what to listen for in a piece of music, the sounds of the instruments you're hearing, the characteristics of the instruments you're hearing. I'm not necessarily even just in classical music, but also in jazz, in pop, in Mm. music of every genre, teaches you to listen to music, I think, in a different way, in a more informed way, in a more focused way. And of course, traditionally, probably not so much now, sadly, but there's often opportunity in schools to attend concerts as part of a school trip. And I think that does a lot to break down the barriers of intimidation that can so easily be felt by young people, by children. And of course, that's then carried into adulthood without an opportunity Mm. of that being addressed without that education. That's a good point, yeah. I think also schools could often provide a resource that may be out of reach of parents from the financial point of view. Let's face it, attending concerts can be expensive and prohibitively so in many cases. And those and, and children coming from such backgrounds would perhaps not otherwise have an opportunity to hear music. I think there's also the social aspect. If you play an instrument, you are taught social skills to an extent. Yeah. You learn to express yourself in a constructive way to other people. You learn give and take respect for the opinions and views of others. And that's taking place in, if you like, a safe environment of a musical rehearsal or a musical performance. And mm. I think for all these reasons, to be honest, I think it's, and probably many other reasons too, why it is so utterly short-sighted that the current government has cut back and cut back and cut back on the provision of music in schools. Mm. What they're doing by doing that is potentially disinherit a generation, an entire generation, or at the very least, ensuring that only those children from wealthy enough backgrounds have the opportunity to experience music. So what are we going to have, a two-tier society where only privileged children have the opportunity to experience this wonderful cultural heritage and this wonderful exploration for themselves. Yes, I totally agree with you. It's absolutely dreadful. Mm. And our second question, why is music good for us? Well, I think one aspect of this I've touched on already in terms of that music can remind us of the need of give and take and that respect for opinions and views of others is something that has sadly become rather lacking in the modern world. You only have to look Mm. at the furore of Brexit and the violent and destructive ways in which people are are expressing themselves over that issue. The dreadful sentiments that are being expressed in some quarters and the, the utterly abhorrent views that are being put across and people feel they can do that with impunity. It doesn't matter. And Mm. I think with music, you have to have respect for others. You have to accept give and take. You have to accept the fact that somebody may not have the same view as yourself and that you appreciate as a listener as well, not just as a performer. If you listen to a jazz group or you listen to an orchestral performance or a string quartet performance, there's give and take. Sometimes somebody has something to say. Sometimes somebody else has something to say. And it's said in different ways, but everything contributes to the whole performance, the whole experience, if you like. I think that's a really excellent point. I think the other reason I feel that that music is good for us is because it expresses the full gamut of human emotions. And I think these can sometimes paradoxically be ironed out 
in today's world. Yes, you, you, you have the strong feelings over certain issues. But then on the other hand, you have communities like Facebook where everybody's got to be a friend and everybody mm. needs to be happy and successful all the time. And we've heard dreadful things about what that's doing to young people and yeah. suicide rates and so on with people who are only appreciating one side of other people's lives and it's being projected as such being portrayed with a very specific end in mind and i think music can remind us that there are other sides to human nature darker sides lighter sides as well and can bring us to that reality with a great deal of power and immediacy and by doing that we face our own humanity yeah what wonderful points you've made thank you so much thank you well thank you so much for coming on our podcast today it's been fantastic to talk to you it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much indeed <laughs> okay i'll see you soon thank you all right okay bye for now